Thank you. Hi, everybody. Are you awake? All right. It's time. I'm so excited to be here because I've just been looking forward to this since Jennifer, who I adore, wrangled me at a conference that we were at together. And I thought, what a privilege. I'm going to get to be in your presence today. I'm going to get to feel you and remember why I get up every morning and do the work that I do. So thank you for inspiring all of us and inspiring me to do the work that I do. This is the very first public appearance of, I love the animation, just, just like go for it here. Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. This is our 25th anniversary, and we realized that the word fund was making people think that either we had a lot of money or we were giving away a lot of money. And really, who we are is a group that wants to partner. And so this is our opportunity to really speak to partnership, and that includes with all of you. So I'm here in honor and in memory. I'm not a survivor. I'm a survivor of witnessing. I'm somebody who has witnessed, who has held, and who has honored, and who has been at the side of. So as a co-survivor, I really am here with that passion and bringing the dignity of the women that I have loved and lost to breast cancer. And I'd like to start with a story about our founder. It was 1991. She was 42 years old. This story is not unfamiliar. It could be told and retold in this room. She had a six-year-old daughter. She had just gotten married six months before, remarried. She'd had a mammogram because her sister-in-law had been diagnosed. She was good. She was following the protocols. She felt a lump, and she went home. And back in 1991, they told her to go home and put her affairs in order. Andrea Martin said, I'm going to change the way we think and act about breast cancer in whatever time we have left. Being a woman who had access to care, who had just been screened, who knew that she'd have support, recognized that she went through her treatment that not everyone did. And she felt that it was imperative that she invest the time and energy that she had to making a difference. She was a woman, a successful woman. She was working for soon-to-be Senator Feinstein. She was an attorney. She had all that she needed except the prospect that she would raise her daughter. That motivated her, and from her living room floor, Andrea began sending out postcards and, and letters. You know, we did it that way, right? You know, actually hand-wrote letters, reached out to everyone that she knew, and she said, what do we have to do? How do we, how do we deal with this? We, we're using radiation to screen for a disease that isn't catching everything. We're treating people with radiation that we know is a carcinogen. I'm loading all kinds of toxic chemicals to survive, all of which I will, I will do because I want to and I have to. But there has to be something else that we need to know and something else that we need to learn. Meanwhile, this was happening all over the country. It was getting beyond awareness of breast cancer. Is anyone here not aware that we have a breast cancer epidemic? Is anyone not aware? And Andrea said, one in eight is not a real, it's a number. It's not real to me. If you're the one, you're the one. It's not about the number. It's not about the eight. It's about me. It's about my life. And she heard about a group in Long Island. I don't know if all of you are familiar with the group that sat in their living room in their kitchens with pushpins and a map of Long Island, putting pushpins down for all the women, their friends and their neighbors. Women in Cape Cod who were gathering to wonder, is it the cranberry bogs? What's going on? There's so much breast cancer in Massachusetts. She gathered those people, began talking about it and saying, we have to deal with treatment. We have to deal with access to care. We need all of the research that's being done to provide less toxic treatment, more efficacy in our care. We need access. 
but we need to understand what is causing the dramatic rise in breast cancer. And Andrea Martin raised a question that had not been raised in what was a budding movement then. What is causing the increase beyond what we already know? Is socioeconomic status an actual thing? Does your ATM card give you breast cancer? Does your education give you breast cancer? What's it a proxy for? How am I going to understand this? What are causes that are not traditional risk factors? Is there a possibility that there's a connection that hasn't been made, and can we prevent even one or 1,000 or some of the 40,000 every year? Can we reduce the risk of breast cancer by understanding it better in a different way? Andrea Martin began what she called the path to prevention. It was heresy back then. Nobody really wanted to talk about the possibility that we could reduce risk, that we could actually, perhaps, by looking at exposure to toxic chemicals and unnecessary radiation, that we could reduce risk. So Andrea began that conversation. It was a new conversation. I met her as she was doing that. I, I've got the perfect resume to get involved as an activist. I was a nurse a psychiatric nurse, so that kind of fits, right? Whole crazy field. And then I was a nightclub owner. For those of you in the Bay Area, do you know the Great American Music Hall? OK. I was the co-founder of that venue and did music, theater, and film producing. So it made perfect sense that when Andrea reached out to me and said, will you help me put together a mountain climb of Mount McKinley? I said, sure. I didn't know the difference between a crampon and whatever rhymes with it, but I was going to get involved with this woman who was really pushing the envelope. And that's how I got involved, was producing a film about women who climb Mount McKinley, because as Andrea said, we have to shout from a mountaintop. This is not a walk in the park. This is something that will take one step at a time, with our eye on the summit, rope together as a team, to figure it out, and we have to really appreciate the journey as we go. And Andrea just rang the bell. She rang it, and she said, tick tock, this has got to stop. We have got to move this along. Every day and every minute that goes by is not OK. So that's how I got involved with the Breast Cancer Fund at the time. And as Andrea became ill with a brain tumor uh, in 2001, we gathered, as we do, and we said, you know what? This path that she started us on needs to be our primary focus. So in 2002, we dedicated the mission of the organization to be solely to look at environmental causes of the disease and to solely work on the reduction of our exposure to toxic chemicals and radiation and to ask and answer the question, is there a connection between the environment and breast cancer. And if there is, if we can demonstrate that through our advocacy for science, through our review of the literature, through our translation of that science, can we actually do something about it? And that's when we began aggregating science and releasing reports like State of the Evidence, the connection between breast cancer and the environment. We are now talking about primary prevention of breast cancer in a way that did not happen when Andrea first raised it. We are now talking about reducing all of our risk. And that includes our risk of, of recurrence, of, of the risk to our healthy lives as we go forward. For those who have already been diagnosed with breast cancer, who are dealing with it, it's an opportunity for us to help translate back what you can do to reduce your risk. You'll hear more about that when Shareem, our director of science, comes up to speak. But basically, I'm here to say it's real, the science is there, the scientific evidence is there, and what it takes is a movement. What it takes is a movement of women to move the next big issue on the breast cancer platform. And I'm going to give you an example of how I know that it's all of you, not some of us who've been around a little bit longer. About three or four years ago, I was out with my grandkids, out on the beach, and we were playing Frisbee. 
And I went for the Frisbee. I leapt in the air. I felt so good. I was flying. And as I was up there, I thought, shoot, I'm going to come down. It's not going to be good. And sure enough, I came down, and it wasn't good, and I totally wrecked my knee. And so I hobbled along and got into work a couple of days later, all hobbled up. And people in my generation said to me, what were you thinking? Like, that was really stupid. You can't go for a Frisbee at your age. People about 10 or 20 years younger than me said, can I do something for you? Can I get you some tea? How are you feeling? My young staff said, did you catch it? <laughs> did you catch it? Now, I'm going to go down in history as saying I caught it, because nobody was there. But the whole idea that young and younger millennials, all of you out here, are going to say, did you catch it? That's how you think. That's what's going to make the difference. That's what's going to move this. It's not about staid science. It's not about can we write the best possible piece of legislation, which we do. It's not about whether or not we go and meet with people who have similar haircuts to me um, in Washington, DC. It's not so much about that as it's about what you do. It's about how you take that and how you move with it and whether or not you're willing and able to figure out the place where you can catch it. So what we're doing is advocacy, is taking science, translating it into public education. You can go out and, and see our table out there. Sarah and the team will be happy to show you our Campaign for Safe Cosmetics. You'll hear more later about our cleaning products work. There's all kinds of things that you can educate yourself about, and it does more than one thing. It not only reduces your exposure to the toxic chemicals in, in your everyday world, but it sends a, mes a message to business. It says business is not going to be conducted as usual. You can actually make a difference in what people produce and sell you based on what you buy. We have tremendous buying power. We are the shoppers, let's face it, right? And I'm not saying we can shop our way out of this entire situation, but we certainly can make a difference. Then we take that knowledge, that science, and we also translate it into what kind of protective policy do we need? Now, breast cancer is a nonpartisan issue. As a 501 nonprofit, we are nonpartisan, but we are not unconscious. This is a really difficult time to be working on policy in this country when it has to do with chemicals, when it has to do with our exposure. So more than ever, truly and sincerely, we need the voices of women saying enough is enough. Whatever else you do, you can't take away my access to care. You can't take away the research that will give me treatment, and you can't take away the regulation that will protect me from exposure. That's our work. That's what we're doing. And that's what we need all of you to be engaged in. You need all of you to be engaged in. This is a community effort. This is not us asking you to do something. You need to ask us to do something. That's part of why we're here. So I hope during the Q&A, you'll tell us what, you, what else you would like us to do. The next big piece of this that I want to talk about is how this work that we're doing in breast cancer, Jennifer gave me the five minute and I'm good, um, how the next big piece in, in uh, how breast cancer fits into a bigger movement, how it aligns with reproductive health, with climate change, with asthma, with lung disease. We're not alone in this. Many of the same chemicals associated with increased risk of breast cancer are causing reproductive harm, are causing learning disabilities, are causing asthma, air pollution that contributes to a host of diseases and conditions. So our job is to align across those sectors with people who are involved in public health, in environmental health, and environmental justice, because we all know that there are those who are disproportionately affected because of where they live, 
what they have access to, what they're exposed to in their workplace, what they're exposed to if they live in a food desert and can't get healthy food. It might be easy for us in this room to say, I can shop organic. Not everybody can do that. So our responsibility is to align across that to really be part of a bigger solution. One of the efforts that we're involved in, and happy to talk more about it, is something called the Cancer-Free Economy Network. The concept of that is the economy is contributing to our ill health by the way it's constructed, by the way it puts in front of us toxic chemicals and radiation that contribute to disease. So in the big picture, we need to align across movements in the everyday, make smart decisions, support the organization that's doing a phenomenal job, and please stand up as advocates, make your voices heard. If you haven't had your picture taken to be put on a postcard to go to senators, please go out to Breast Cancer Prevention Partners table and, uh, and we'll let them know how you really feel about it. That's it for me. Okay, now you, can, oops, now you can tell why I think she's amazing, right? Um, thank you again, Jeannie. That was amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. So I'm about to introduce our next speaker, who I also think is awesome. Um, but before I do that, just put it in the back of your head. We are going to be using the app again for questions. Same setup as this morning. Um, so start thinking about your questions. But also... You know, as Sue talked about and I talked about yesterday, we are a community, and community is incredibly, incredibly powerful. So as you're sitting and listening, and you're gonna listen to Sharima, what, think about what are you gonna do with that power? You, individually you. Um, so just put that thought in your head. Um, oh, I almost didn't read her introduction. <laughs> Um, okay, so our next speaker is amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, Sharima is the Director of si uh, Science at Breast, Ca Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, I almost said Breast Cancer Fund, uh, where she works to ensure that the organization continues to be a national leader in science-based environmental health advocacy. She oversees the organization's science-related activities, including monitoring and interpreting emerging scientific research. Translation, she's wicked smart and developing and managing science-related program and policy initiatives. Please help me in welcoming. Okay, is this on? Yay. So I get to follow Jeannie, which is, thanks Jeannie. <laughs> But thank you so much uh, for inviting me to talk to you. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information on breast cancer and the environment, what we know, and what we can do. Um, really excited, so this is the first time we're presenting Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. Um, our design people made sure I've got the right font. It looks beautiful, so I'm really excited. And I'm the first person doing this from our organization. All right, I'm gonna start with my um, take home messages, which is what somebody told me you have to do at a talk like this. So my three points are get informed, shop smart, and advocate. So I'm gonna give you a lot of information in this talk, but please visit our website, www.bcpp.org. It's a lot easier than our old one. Um, find out more, get tips on what you can do at home, and get involved in our advocacy to remove chemicals and radiation linked to breast cancer from our environment. You can also go and talk to Sarah and the team at our booth to, to find out more about what we're doing right here. So I'm gonna go through what we, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, and I apologize if I say Breast Cancer Fund, I'm still learning this. Um, breast Cancer Prevention Partners, what we know about exposures linked to breast cancer, what are the exposures we're concerned about, and why, what's the science behind that? And then I'm gonna go through exposures we may encounter during a typical day, 
um, and tips of what we can do individually and collectively to reduce our exposures and therefore our risk. Now, everything I am going to talk about today is based on peer-reviewed research, and the research out there mostly looks at primary prevention of breast cancer, which is stopping the disease before it starts. But we believe this research also holds true for reducing risks of recurrence, of metastasis, and, and other outcomes after diagnosis. And I will say that this is actually one of the major projects, the first major project we're going to do at BCPP is going to be looking specifically at what evidence is out there in the literature on post-diagnosis outcomes and environmental factors so that we can really say for sure what are the tips that would work for you. And so please keep an eye out for that. But as I say, these tips are likely to work for you. I'm, I'm a scientist, so I, I, I always have caveats, but, but we're pretty sure these are good for everyone. So there are three categories of exposures linked to breast cancer that we're worried about. There are carcinogens. These are chemicals that have been shown to cause cancer by, uh, and that evidence is from international organizations like the World Health Organization, our own national toxicology program. Then for breast cancer in particular, there's hormone disruptors. You may have heard of EDCs, endocrine disrupting compounds. Those are hormone disruptors. And they're chemicals which disrupt the body's hormones. And in particular, we're concerned about those that have been shown to increase the risk of breast cancer in humans or mammary cancer in, in mammals, in other mammals. Um, and then finally, physical agents that have been linked to breast cancer, including light at night, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more later, and ionizing radiation. So these exposures, we're exposed to them everywhere. We're exposed to them at home in the products that we use and consume. We're exposed to them at work through the chemicals we may work with and conditions of our workplace. And we're exposed indoors and out um, through environmental pollutants and other factors uh, in the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the products we consume and put on our bodies. Now, people at this stage in my talks are normally getting very scared. And I want to I wanna telegraph that I'm going to give you a whole load of options. What's really great these days is there are options to avoid all of these. Some of them aren't that expensive. Some of them are really simple. And the other thing I want to make clear is not everybody exposed to the same exposure will have the same reaction. Exposure effects vary. It's very important the timing of when you're exposed. Um, there are periods during our lives that you may have heard of the... Uh, the phrase windows of vulnerability or susceptibility, and that's when exposures to certain chemicals can have greater effects. Um, a really vulnerable time is prenatally within the womb. The fetus is developing very rapidly and tiny changes in chemicals and hormones that um, the fetus is, is exposed to can change breast development in a way that can uh, predispose for later life breast cancer. Other times when we're developing rapidly is, are also um, worrying times uh, in childhood, especially during puberty, and then during pregnancy and lactation. Uh, as you know, whenever your breasts are, ch are changing, um, that's a time when they're most vulnerable. The underlying susceptibility of individuals matter. Um, so an example of this, not, not everybody, as I say, reacts to the same exposures the same way. So those, are, those of us that have BRCA1 or 2 mutations, um, people with those mutations are more susceptible to DNA damage from radiation, from ionizing radiation. So those people with those mutations need to be aware of that and be a little bit more careful with x-rays or working with ionizing radiation and be aware that, that that's a risk factor for them. Societal factors matter. Um, we all know that we should eat, eat healthily and get lots of exercise, but not everyone has the opportunity to safely exercise in their neighborhood. Not everybody has healthful food available to them. Uh, also, social stress is emerging as a very important factor in determining risk of breast cancer. So a lot more work needs to be on, done on these societal factors, and BCPP has, is just starting a two-year project uh, being sponsored by the California Breast Cancer Research Program, where we're working with regulators and legislators in California 
scientists and other advocates to try and produce a breast cancer primary prevention plan that looks at all these factors and comes up with policy options for the state of California to decrease risk. Um, and so that's just starting and hopefully in 2019, you'll see a, a report coming out about that. And finally, we are not exposed to one chemical at a time. We are constantly wading through a soup of exposures. Um, the same chemical may be present in dozens of products that we use every day and in combination with dozens of others that may have similar effects. We hear a lot from, from companies who use chemicals that we are concerned about that in their product, the dose is so tiny that it doesn't matter. And it's, it's not true. These doses add up and we are, we are exposed every day. And when we talk about hormone disruptors, even really tiny doses may be of concern. Our natural hormones work at very low doses and cause enormous important changes in our body, and endocrine disruptors work in the same way. So, now I've scared you all. I'm going to talk about exposures through the day. What might you, might you encounter, and, and what are the options? What can you do? Um, so... Um, the details of all the exposures I'm going to talk about are available on our website, bcpp.org, or go out to our um, booth outside. Um, it's going to be a whirlwind, but I'm hoping just to give you a starting point to find out more. Wake up time. So I'm going to go through like an hour of every hour of the day. So you wake up, you put on your face. Yeah. Um, as I've said before, personal care products can have dozens of chemicals of concern in them. Uh, I could go through a whole bunch of chemical names, uh, some of them you'll have heard, uh, phthalates, long-chain parabens, formaldehyde, some of those you haven't. Um, so check our website for details on chemicals of concern. We have a, what we call our red list. We've got a little wallet card out on our uh, booth that has a list of them. And here's where the slightly good news. Most ingredients in personal care products are listed on the label. So this is where you can use our red list, and then there are some great smartphone apps like uh, Think Dirty on iPhones, EWG's Healthy Living app is a great app, and The Good Guide, uh, which help you choose, when you're in the store, you can scan the label of a product, scan the barcode, and it'll tell you, it'll give a scoring rating on whether that product is healthy or not. Um, and it actually, for some of those apps, it also will give you a op uh, an option of a safer alternative you might want to buy instead. So th those are great. Um, however, some chemicals, such as ingredients of fragrance and contaminants, are not listed on the label. And here, um, we recommend going with, uh, with brands and companies that do list everything, including, um, including fragrance. And I know Honest is going to talk in a minute, and, and they do that. Um, uh, but also, there's now some really good third-party certification scheme uh, programs out there. Um, but you need to be aware of what those programs are certifying. You need to choose one that's transparent about how it rates its products. So I'm just going to say the claims of natural or organic on non-food items mean nothing. So people put that on their, uh, on their bottles and it means nothing, so don't be fooled by that. At Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, uh, we're working with Made Safe, um, www.madesafe.org. They have a great certification program and they really do their homework on each of the products that they certify. So if, if you can find one of their products, that's great. But as I say, this is an area that, as Jeannie said, needs collective action. We should have health protective laws that at least tell us what are the intentionally added ingredients in personal care products. And at BCPP, we're working to enact such laws. And again, visit our website, join us, and help, help us pass these laws. OK. You got up. You got through your morning routine. Some of you took your kids to school. And here is a really great opportunity for action. Schools, they're a great space for local advocacy, um, you can help ensure that, um, that your play spaces are free of pesticides. Pesticides are linked not only to breast cancer, but to a variety of very serious chronic health effects. Um, and also, if possible, to have fresh and, if possible, organic lunches. Again, 
um, organic to try and reduce pesticide exposure and fresh um, to um, avoid food packaging chemicals that are concerning. Work time. So those of you that are going into work, there can be a number of exposures linked to breast cancer at work. Um, in 2015, we published uh, a paper on uh, jobs and exposures linked to breast cancer. And so there are certain occupations that, that have been linked to a higher risk of breast cancer. Uh, some of these aren't so surprising, some are. So there's food and beverage workers, um, hairdressers and cosmetologists, nurses and doctors, especially those working with radiation and other me medical workers, women who work with solvents, but even teachers and librarians. Now, while some of these increased risks can be linked to chemical exposures, others cannot, and we've called for more research on women in the workplace. I mean, the main problem is a lot of the occupational research looking at workplace-related sicknesses has been done on men, historically because men were in the workplace more and there weren't that many women in the workplace. Um, but if you do all your research on men, you're not gonna see breast cancer and you're not gonna to be able to identify what's causing it. So we've called for more uh, research for, on women in the workplace and uh, to clarify what is happening and what we can do to mitigate those risks. In the meantime, what people can do in their workplace is ask for transparency. What is it that we're exposed to at work? You can work with employers to transition to safer chemicals and practices. The best thing is not to have any of these chemicals in the workplace. And if you can't do that, and we at BCPP, we work with the San Francisco Fire Department with some amazing women who work in the fire department. They can't choose what chemicals they're exposed to when they're attending a fire. If you can't decrease your exposures that way, wear your personal protective equipment. Make sure there's personal protective equipment available and wear it. Um, and important, most importantly, ensure it fits properly. Again, and this is a particular problem in the fire service, most personal protective equipment at work is designed for men. Um, and women on average are smaller than men and have um, different shapes. And it's a small thing, but if, if, your, uh, if your mask doesn't fit your face, it's not gonna help you. So work with your employer to make sure that the protective equipment available is, oh my goodness, all right. Lunchtime, as I said, fresh organic foods, um, and don't microwave in plastic. Uh, a lot of these, these chemicals leach out from plastic. Okay, this is something, wear sunscreen. Wear sunscreen or uh, wear a hat or clothing that covers you up out in the sun. Avoid some of the estrogenic UV filters. We recommend uh, non-nano titanium dioxide or zinc oxide in a cream form. You don't want to be inhaling your sunscreen. After school, wash hands. You don't want to have dust coming into your home and, and you don't want to be eating the chemicals that are in that dust that you're bringing in from outside. Um, take your shoes off at the door. Cooking time, food prep. As I say, try not to use food in cans. Um, we did a report last year showing that BPA is still in a lot of cans. BPA is an estrogenic substance linked to breast cancer. Um, but we found that there has been some transition away from it, but to alternatives that we don't know what the safety of those alternatives are. So until we do know that, we recommend limiting cans. Um, and we also, on food prep, we recommend not using non-stick, which is made with, even I can't say, perfluoroalkyl substances, including PFOS, which is Teflon. We recommend stainless steel, cast iron, or um, ceramic cookware. I'm gonna give a plug to Honest here. When you're cleaning up, unlike personal care products, cleaning products do not have to be labeled in this country. They can put anything in a cleaning product other than a pesticide like bleach without telling you that what's in it. Um, some companies like Honest are labeling all of their ingredients, and so we encourage you to go to companies like that who are doing that. Um, and also, it's our major um, action that we're promoting here today is to ask in California, we have a bill in California 
um, Senate right now asking to um, label all cleaning products sold in California with all of their ingredients. So please sign up at our booth. Screen time. We all like to curl up with our screens. What I uh, would say is just be aware how you dispose of your electronics. There's some nasty chemicals in batteries and electronics um, that we don't want getting into uh, the waste stream and into our bodies. Bedtime, we're almost there, almost there. <laughs> um, there are a lot of chemical flame retardants in, in furniture in general and in mattresses. They don't need to be there. Um, there's some natural flame retardant barriers like wool that work just as effectively. Um, as I say, we work with the fire department in San Francisco. They agree with everything we say on this slide. Um, but, um, but they're in there and there, many of those chemicals have been linked to breast cancer. There's been a recent change in California where furniture manufacturers have to label um, all of their furniture, whether they contain flame retardants or not. So when you make a purchase, you can make that choice. And because California is the biggest market in the US, we find that manufacturers are labeling all of their products, not just the California ones. So look out for those labels or ask the manufacturer when you're buying new furniture. And finally, nighttime. This is the thing that surprised me the most. I started working with uh, breast cancer prevention partners six years ago. And this was the thing that shocked me that um, light at night is linked to uh, increased risk of breast cancer. It is, um, there's lots of evidence of this. The mechanism is still being looked at. We don't know why, but we know it's true. So it may be due to the effect light has on our melatonin levels, or it may be about disturbed sleep, it may be about stress, but it may be a combination. But if you have outside light filtering into your room, try and make your room as dark as possible. Use an eye mask. Um, if you're reading at night with a device, a lot of the new ones have a, um, a night shift, I think it's called on the iPhone, and it's called something else on Kindles, that makes the light red. Red light isn't a problem, it's blue light you've got to worry about. If you work at night, make sure when you do go to sleep, you're in a dark room and ask if it's possible to use red hued lights at work if you're working nights. So almost there. I talked through about what we can do as individuals, uh, choosing the products we want to have in our homes and at work, trying to avoid those we're concerned about. There's a lot of action we can take in communities in a similar way. I know our neighborhood group uh, in San Francisco, um, we, we've decided not to use um, pesticides in our yards you know, as, as, a, as a neighborhood. But a lot of this is out of our individual or even community control. Companies are allowed to pretty much put anything they want into uh, the products that they sell to us. Chemicals enter commerce without safety testing first. A lot of people think it's like drugs, that you know, the FDA is testing everything for safety before it's allowed to come on the market, and it's not. There is no testing at all for safety of chemicals in personal care products or in commerce. And so, this is where we can work collectively to change the rules of that game. BCPP has a proud history of working with people like you, organizations like YSC, to put forward health protective laws and policies and stop the worst policies being enacted. We're gonna to continue to do so and hope you can join us on our mission to eliminate exposures to toxic chemicals and radiation linked to breast cancer. Your voice matters, maybe now more than ever. So what can we do? Get informed. Go to bcpp.org, go visit our uh, booth, shop smart, use apps, don't be fooled by natural or organic claims, except on food, and advocate. Join us and help me make the environment better for everyone. And I'm gonna bring Andrea back in the room. Um, with teamwork and perseverance, anything is possible if taken one step at a time. Thank you. All right, so I told you she was wicked smart. Uh, Shreema, thanks again. We're, I can't see with the light. Thank you, she's amazing. Thank you so much. 
So our last speaker, and then we're going to bring them all back and give you a chance to ask them questions, um, is Sarah Irvin. She is the Director of Community Affairs at The Honest Company, which we're excited to hear more about, I'm sure, if you haven't heard about them. Um, in this role, she manages the company's advocacy efforts at the federal, state, and local level on issues ranging from labeling transparency, product safety, and support for scientific and environmental health research. We are psyched she's here, so I'm gonna hand over the mic. Here you go, <laughs> have fun. Thank you. <laughs> Hi guys. Sorry, I have my notes in front of me. Um, I'll do my best to look up. <laughs> um, but hello everyone, thank you so much for having me here again. Um, my name's Sarah Irvin. I'm the Director of Governmental Affairs at The Honest Company. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a, um, a consumer products company, um, and we like to think of ourselves as a healthy lifestyle brand. Um, we were founded by um, uh, Jessica Alba and uh, Christopher Gavigan. Um, I think most people are familiar with Jessica's name. Um, Christopher was a, uh, he is a lifelong public health advocate. Um, he was the former CEO of an organization called Healthy Child, Healthy World, which is now part of the Environmental Working Group. And um, he has spent his career working with public health advocates like Jeannie and scientists like Shreema, um, who are uncovering all of these uh, potential health risks that are linked to chemicals and other uh, toxins that we're exposed to in our, in our environment. And when we say environment, um, we mean everything that is in, on, and around us. So um, back in 2008, so gosh, almost 10 years ago, Jessica was pregnant with her first child and uh, like many people, was becoming more and more uh, aware of the products that she was buying and bringing into her home. Um, she, she tells this story about uh, actually her baby shower. She was given you know, a lot of uh, clothes for her, for her new baby and she went home to wash them um, with detergent, which you know, everybody is told to do, wash your, wash your newborn's clothes before the baby is born. And she broke out in a really severe rash and she had had a childhood of um, being in and out of the hospital uh, with uh, very severe allergic reactions. Um, she suffered from asthma and other um, health issues as a child, and so she became increasingly concerned about what were these chemicals that she was bringing in for her new baby. And so she, uh, she met Christopher actually at a book launch party uh, for, for his book called Healthy Child, Healthy World. And they started talking and they started brainstorming about, you know, what were the types of products that they as parents wanted to, to bring into their homes. Um, and they, they brainstormed this for a couple of years, um, and they actually pitched it out to a number of investors who were like, eh, we're gonna pass. You know, I don't think there's really a market for that. Um, and then, uh, th but they, they persevered and, uh, and, and finally they, they found a team of um, product formulators, uh, people out there in the, in the consumer products world that were interested in creating products that, that um, kind of held to this standard of uh, not using harsh ingredients, using alternative ingredients where possible. And so, um, Finally, in 2012, uh, they launched The Honest Company, and uh, our mission is to inspire and empower people to live healthy and happy lives. Um, so how do we do this? Well, uh, or actually, excuse me, jumping ahead of myself. Um, our current product categories, um, for those of you who, again, aren't familiar with us, we started off, I think a lot of people think of us as a baby brand. Um, we do have a lot of products in the, in the baby and kids sector, but we also, um, we have about 100 products across a wide range of categories. So we, are, we have a lot of personal care products um, and feminine care. We also have a, um, a home care household cleaning line. Um, we have vitamins and supplements. And then just about a little over a year ago, we, want, we launched a new brand called Honest Beauty, um, which is a, uh, a line of high performance skincare, uh, makeup, and hair care. Um, and so, you know, we, we sort of, we're still in a lot of ways, I think, thought of as a baby brand, but we like to tell people we, we have products for, for every age. Um, so we started as an e-com uh, company. At first, you could only buy us at honest.com. We now, thankfully, are in a lot of retail stores that people shop in every day. Um, we're in about 12,000 stores nationwide. You can find us at Target. You can find us at Costco. Uh, we just launched that last month, I think, in CVS. Um, Whole Foods is a big partner of ours, Kroger Markets, and then um, you can also find us at other 
e-tailers. I didn't even know that was a word, um, but places like Jet, Zulily, and Thrive Market um, are also big partners of ours. Um, but really, not those stores don't carry all of our products, so we do encourage you to visit us at honest.com and honestbeauty.com uh, to see all of the different products that we do offer because a lot of those stores might carry two or three products but not the whole offering. But this is not a product plug, so let me move on. Um, so our, our basically our, our ethos um, is that we want to create products that um, adhere to rigorous standards that we have set for safety and transparency, uh, modern design, uh, you want your products to look good and, and feel good, and high quality performance. You want them to work, right? You don't want a cleaner that's not gonna actually get your house clean. Um, so we believe that this is possible, and we believe that for the products that people use should be safe for them and their families, and they should enjoy using them. And so in doing our product formulation, we are vigilant to the latest chemical science, and we look to organizations like Breast Cancer Prevention Partners and um, you know, the federally funded research, and I'll get into that a little bit later, um, to really inform us as we do our product uh, formulation on what are these, what are we discovering about the links between chemical exposure and impacts on human health. So in other words, we're very purposeful. We like to use that word purpose a lot. We have a chief purpose officer, actually, Christopher, our co-founder, used to be our chief products officer, is now our chief purpose officer. And it's because he really wants to embed that mission and that purpose into everything that we do. Um, so, you know, we've, we've followed a lot of great models that are out there. There are tons of companies uh, that are doing this, that are holding themselves to very high standards. Um, and in, a, in some cases, we've pioneered some new solutions as well, but we're always looking for ways to improve, and we really look to our consumers to give us that feedback. Is this product working for you? Is it not? You know, what was your reaction to it? So we're, we're, we very much believe in engaging with our consumers. Um, and we know that people want to be informed about the products that they're using, and they want to hear the science, and they want to know what is it that, you know, why would you choose to use this, you know, ingredient and not this one. So we, we try and do a lot of that engagement and education with our consumers. Um, Another, uh, another thing that we like to say is that at Honest, we are committed to this promise of creating a, a cleaner world. And um, that, this is really how we live our mission. So for, the, for, for, um, for us, it means we consciously control what goes in and does not go into our products. But we also engage with our consumers, we support science and research, and we actively advocate. And I know you've heard that word a lot today, which I love, because uh, I come from an advocacy background, but we actively advocate for uh, better laws that are gonna protect us and our families. Um, so a little bit on some of the science and research that we, uh, that we are very supportive of. So in the five years since we, uh, since we launched, we are very proud to have grown to a point where we can actually invest in some of that science and research that is going to give us the evidence to protect ourselves and our families from um, you know, these potentially harmful effects of chemicals on our health. Um, so for the last couple of years, since 2014, we've had the privilege of sponsoring a state-of-the-art facility um, at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York that is conducting groundbreaking research on the impact of chemicals in the environment on children's health. Um, and that's, you can see the, the ribbon cutting there. Um, Last year, um, just back in November, we joined in celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, or NIEHS. Um, this is the nation's largest source of funding for environmental health research. And I'm just gonna give a little shout out to Jeannie. She was awarded one of the very first ever uh, NIEHS Champions of Science Award at that uh, 50th anniversary, and so we're very proud of her. <laughs> Uh, and then we were also, we were invited to Capitol Hill to, um, you know, we, there are these briefings that occur on the Hill all the time. Um, I used to be a staffer there myself, and I would go to these, and it was always, you know, the science community would come in and talk about science, and then they'd leave. And then the business community would come in and talk about business, and then they'd leave. And there was never that link between the two, at least when I was there. And I think right now, we're sort of in this very interesting time where a lot of companies are like us, trying to make that link between science and the products that they're making. And so we were, we were invited to, to join a number of researchers on the Hill to talk about how um, federally funded research is actually driving innovation and new product development in the private sector. Um, and you know, we, we think that that's an important link to make, that when, you know, when Congress invests in science and research, yes, it leads to new discoveries, but it also leads to new innovation and economic growth in the marketplace. And I think that you know, we try and translate that into a nonpartisan 
message. Um, so I just want to take a minute to highlight one uh, NIEHS-funded uh, study that I think is just, it's really amazing, and, and I think that this is going to help pave the way for a lot of more studies like this. Um, this one was up at UC Berkeley. It was published uh, a year ago in March and then later fe featured um, in, on Good Morning America, so some of you may have seen it. It was focused on the link between um, cosmetics and chemical exposure in young women. Um, it was called, or it is called the Health and Environmental Research on Makeup of Salinas Adolescents. That's a mouthful. They shortened it into the Hermosa study. Um, and it was led by a woman named Dr. Kim Harley uh, here at Berkeley. And actually Jeannie and Sharima helped advise uh, as this study was getting developed and then as it was underway. Um, and it, I think it's, it took a very unique approach. They, for, they engaged about 100 teenage young adolescent women um, in the Salinas Valley and for about a week, not years, I mean this is a very short period of time, they, these young girls were given um, cosmetic products that were free of some of the common chemicals that Sharima mentioned, these, these classes of chemicals called phthalates, parabens, triclosan, formaldehyde, um, and unfortunately these are categories of chemicals that are commonly used in cosmetics and perfume, hair products and lotions, things that we use every day, um, but they have been shown in animal studies um, at least to interfere with um, the body's endocrine system, so they are those hormone disrupting chemicals. Um, in this study, again, very short period of time, they tracked through urine samples, um, they tracked these girls before, during, and after the study. And the Berkeley team found that the chemicals in the girl's body during use of these lower chemical cosmetic products, um, chemicals in their urine actually dropped as much as 45% in just a very short period of time. So you can imagine um, that you know, if you can make an easy change picking products that are lower or free of some of these chemicals, the, your body reacts very quickly to those. Um, so Dr. Harley noted that there, there's limited data about sort of the long-term effects of um, human health and these exposures to these chemicals, but hopefully um, the Hermosa study is helping pave the way for further investigation into how our bodies react to prolonged chemical exposure. Um, and I also thought, and, and this is something for all of the young women in the room and also parents of young women, um, I think it's worth noting that a lot of the um, participants in this study were high schoolers who actually have been given um, citation as co-authors of this study. And I think that that's just, that's an awesome way to inspire more young women to go into science. And, um, and actually there's a quote up here on, on my slide um, from one of the young women, Maritza Cardenas, who uh, at the time was actually a high schooler and is now at Berkeley um, and continuing to do her research. So I just think it's so important for more uh, young women to enter, uh, enter research and, and pursue scientific careers. Um, so okay, so back to, to a little bit of who we are. Um, all of our products at Honest are backed by what we call our Honestly Free Guarantee. Um, this is our way of reassuring you, the consumer, that we are making our products um, without questionable or potentially harmful ingredients. And each of our product categories has their sort of own specific Honestly Free Guarantee um, because there are different chemicals that you would never use in a lotion but that you might use in a hair care product. And so we try and tailor those to those product categories. Um, and so you can see on the screen, our hair care line is you know, made without these ingredients. Um, I am required by our legal and regulatory team to remind you that Jessica herself is not a trained chemist. She is not in there formulating the products, but I can guarantee that she is in there basically every week smelling, feeling, touching what is being formulated in, we now have our own in-house R&D lab um, with experts in cosmetic chemistry, neurobiology, toxicology, who are constantly working on new formulations, and nothing gets made if she doesn't like how it smells, feels, rubs into her skin. Um, so yes, she is very involved, um, and she has very strong opinions. Um, so, uh, okay, five minutes. I'm gonna go through this next part quickly, even though this is my bread and butter. So come find me afterwards, or ask questions about this. But. Um, how else are we living our mission? So through our advocacy work, and I know you, you've heard that word a lot, but um, 
we believe that a company like ours um, has enough influence and brand awareness at this point that we can really use that influence to help raise awareness about um, key issues and policy changes that we would like to see. So uh, real quickly, I'll go through some of these TOSCA reforms. Some of you may have heard that word TOSCA. It stands for the Toxic Substances Control Act. Um, this is a law that uh, basically governs all of the chemicals in commerce um, and had not been updated in four decades since the 70s until last year. Um, Jessica and Christopher actually went to DC a couple of times to uh, urge Congress to strengthen our nation's chemical safety laws. Um, and then last year the bill actually did pa get passed by, uh, by Congress and has been enacted into law. It is not a perfect law, and there was a lot that more that could have been done, but it does make certain key improvements. Um, for, in for instance, now the chemical industry is required to provide health and safety data for new chemicals before they enter the market, which is something that you would assume was the case all along, but it was not. Um, we, as citizens of this great country, need to stay on top of this new administration to make sure that that law is being implemented in the way that it was intended. Um, and so I encourage you to, to just follow what is happening at the EPA, stay a little bit of a, alert to what's happening with TOSCA implementation, and, um, and, and just you know, get more engaged with your, with your members of Congress to stay on top of what's happening at, uh, at the EPA. Um, another area where we are very involved, and, and Jeannie and Shreema both mentioned this, is around this cleaning products and transparency. So um, yes, there are laws on the books that require ingredients in packaged food and in personal care products to be labeled on pack. So you know, you pick up a, a box of you know macaroni and cheese, and you can read exactly what's in that. Uh, and you need to, but not only because you want to avoid some of those you know artificial flavors and dyes, but also if you have. If you yourself have an allergy or your child has an allergy, you need to know that in the food that you're eating. And you need to know it in the, you know, the lotion that you're putting on your skin. You also need to know it in the cleaning products that you're using. I mean, these are things that you are spraying, usually very close to your own face or on the countertop where your kids are eating or you're eating. And, and we believe very firmly that it should be the law that uh, cleaning products are required to label on, um, on pack what is in what is inside it's something that we've done from um, from day one and we think that consumers very much have a right to know so we are working very hard here in California on a new bill that's been introduced called the California cleaning product right to know act and um, I'm gonna make another plug as soon as this session ends go right out to the BCPP table they have postcards that you can sign with your just your name and your city and, and zip code and and the team at BCPP will figure out who your state senator is um, they'll take your picture if you want it and put it right on the postcard so they know you're a real person and um, we think that if this law gets passed here in California it has a really strong chance of becoming the federal standard because basically if if any company wants to sell cleaning products here in California, they would have to abide by that ingredient listing on pack. And anyone who wants to sell in California is not gonna make a different label for every other state. So we believe that, uh, that this is a really important opportunity here in California to make a difference uh, around the country. Um, another area that we are very involved in is uh, personal care product safety. Um, there's a, a bill that was introduced last year that would for the first time since I don't know what, the 30s finally bring the FDA's authority to regulate uh, the cosmetic industry up to date. So really the, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act has hundreds and hundreds of pages about safety standards for food and for drugs, but almost no safety standards for cosmetics. So it's really time to bring that, that law, uh, or excuse me, that authority at the FDA up to date. Um, and we, so we support efforts that, that Senator Feinstein is trying to do here to bring, um, to, with her Personal Care Product Safety Act, and we really want her to, to strengthen what she had previously introduced to include supply chain transparency and full fragrance disclosure. Fragrance is another area that we are, um, that we are active in and that BCPP is very active in, um, and a number of other organizations as well, but we really believe that fragrance transparency is critical. Um, right now, the word fragrance is, is oftentimes protected as a trade secret. So companies can um, sort of hide dozens, sometimes even hundreds of chemicals in that term fragrance. Um, and we don't, we don't believe that's right. Um, at Honest, we do not use any synthetic fragrances. Um, all of our scents are made using essential oil blends and we list these ingredients on, on pack. Um, not on the tiny trial size that's in your bag, I should make note. If you're looking, you're like, wait, 
Not everything's listed, um, it, but on full size products, yes. And in fact, maybe even on the trial size, um, the ingredients are listed, but maybe not our honestly free guarantee. Um, but you can always find all that information on our website and on every full size product that we, that we sell. Um, and we are very excited to be partnering with Jeannie and Sharima and the team at BCPP on their uh, companies for safe cosmetics. There's more information at the table, so please be sure to go out there and learn more about what they're doing around fragrance disclosure. And then one last thing, I just wanna say that in the absence of government regulation, we are actually seeing a lot of progress being made in the private sector. Um, we, we've seen um, actually Target, who's one of our biggest uh, retail partners, just recently in January, um, announced an ambitious new chemical policy. This is one of the most comprehensive of any big retailer in the country, and they are prioritizing transparency, chemical management, um, and innovation. And they've actually given themselves not only these sort of lofty goals around they wanna know what's in every single product that they're selling in their stores, but they also um, want to eliminate certain chemicals of concern by the year 2020, and they wanna invest um, in green chemistry research uh, by the year 2022. So they're making not just these lofty goals, but also having some time-bound uh, commitments as well. And we've also seen companies like SC Johnson and Unilever um, really move in the direction of fragrance disclosure, and we think that is, that is fantastic. Um, uh, SC Johnson started disclosing some of the fragrance and some of their uh, air freshening products last year and uh, just earlier this year, or actually last month, um, Unilever uh, announced that they would start disclosing the fragrance ingredients in some of their brands, including Dove, uh, Noxzema, Lever 2000, and Nexus. So this is, this is really good progress because it, it shows that the truth is there's consumer demand for this. Companies don't just change their mind willy-nilly. They're hearing from their consumers, hey, we wanna know what's in the products that you're making. And even though they're not being required by law to do so, they're moving in that direction. So this is a big move and hopefully it's going to spur other companies to do the same. But it's something that, again, we at Honest have been doing since day one and we are just, we're really excited to see some of this momentum build uh, in the private sector. Um, so moving right along, just a couple other things uh, about us. Uh, we have a very robust social goodness program. We call it our Honest to Goodness program. We donate products to, um, a number of different organizations. We partner with Children's Hospital LA, which is where we're, we're based in Los Angeles. Um, we've partnered with Ronald McDonald Houses around the country. Um, we, we donate products to organizations like Dress for Success and the National Diaper Bank Network, and, um, and we're always looking for opportunities to partner. So um, we were really pleased to be invited here by YSC um, to, to donate product as well. Um, we also, um, partner with an amazing organization that I just wanna give another plug to because I think that they have a lot of really amazing resources online. Um, it's called the Max Love Project and um, it's the third year we've partnered with them. We've been raising money through a social media campaign called Honest Loves Max. Um, it was started by an amazing woman named Audra who um, her son Max was diagnosed with cancer when he was I think about four or five years old um, and she said no, I'm, the." I am going to change how people with cancer are thriving in the face of survivor, as they are survivors. And so she's, she's basically, she's on this mission to help people thrive in the face of cancer by supporting integrative medicine, evidence-based wellness strategies, and what she calls fierce foods. And I think this is where you can get a lot of information because they, they really talk a lot about nutrition and what we're eating and bringing into our bodies um, to help keep us, um, free of cancer, if, if that's possible, or in the case of those that are battling cancer, to help everybody thrive. Um, and so I just, I love Max Loves. Uh, so you can learn, learn more at maxloveproject.org. Um, so just one last thing, and you can pick this up at the table, out again, at BCPP's table in the back. Um, but just a couple of uh, easy tips takeaways that you can do that don't cost any money. Um, you don't need to buy any products to do some of these things at home. And you can pick up a card that has all these tips uh, at their table. But um, things like taking off your shoes when you come home. I'm really bad about it. I walk it all around our house. I need to be better about that. But take off your shoes at the door because you're tracking in a lot of um, dust that can, you know, potentially contains a lot of toxins. Um, be smart about fragrance. Again, look for companies that do disclose what they use in their fragrance. Try to avoid synthetic fragrance when you can. Or go fragrance free. There's plenty of options for fragrance free and that's great. Uh, wash your hands a lot, but avoid triclosan, which again is an, a hormone disrupting chemical. Um, and you don't need it. You don't need antibacterial, uh, you know, um, 
gels and things that have triclosan. You, you can just use rubbing alcohol if you want antibacterial, or you can just use soap and water. Um, uh, other things, you know, um, wet mop if you can. That's another way to clean up dust. Um, be smart about uh, the plastics that you're using. Look for those numbers at the bottom um, of the bottle and use plastics that, that uh, correspond with numbers that we know are hopefully a little bit better for us. Things like opening your window at home, getting outside, um, just fresh air is so important, and house plants. I know that seems silly, but um, <laughs> try to have some fresh plants in your home. It helps clean up the air. So again, um, these are just some simple tips and encourage you to grab a, a cheat sheet uh, before you leave. Um, so in closing, at Honest, we have an informal saying that together we can make it better, and we really mean that. It takes all of us um, to make a difference. Um, I think that you know some key ways that you can do this is, again, through advocacy, tell your story. Um, I went to an awesome breakout session this morning with uh, Metaviver, and they were talking all about all the resources they have for people to get involved in different policy efforts, um, and it makes such a difference. You know? write to Congress, go to DC if you can, or go to your local um, you know, congressional office in your home district. Tell them who you are and what it is that you want them to do. Again, they work for you. Um, elected officials work for you. I know it doesn't always seem like that, but they do. So thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, I look forward to questions. Thank you. Yeah. Anything. I'm a hugger. <laughs> thank you so much. Stay up on the stage. Okay. If you don't mind, that'd be great. Um, if you want, you can leave yeah, it right there. Yeah, I'll just leave that there. Great. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so Janie and Sharima, if you guys are, come on up. And where is Maida and Dana? Okay, they're coming. We're right. here. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I have two quick introductions to make our moderators. Come up here, please. All right, these two amazing young breast cancer survivors, I'm getting closer to the mic. Uh, two amazing young breast cancer survivors are here to uh, moderate, to receive your questions. Um, as we did this morning, um, the fabulous woman on my left is Meta Sutliff. She is a two-time uh, young breast cancer survivor and a YSC staff, a regional outreach manager, um, a YSC superstar, so we're thrilled to have her here. On my right, um, I have Dana Stewart. She um, <laughs> diagnosed at 32, correct? Um, so six and a half years ago, um, and she is also um, a YSC super volunteer. She's um, an Illinois state leader, uh, runs an F2F group, and a RISE advocate. So you guys are in good hands. Have the questions come out, and have a great time. Yeah, of course I get up here without a mic. <laughs> okay, thank you. First, I want to thank our speakers again. Uh, terrific, informative presentations, and we have a ton of questions. Okay. Not a whole lot of time, but that's okay. okay. And uh, really thrilled, actually, to be here in California. You know, you guys here, grassroots, you know, at the forefront, I think, with these messages. But for many of the attendees, I'm in Ohio, we don't hear this. We don't hear it. So I, I think this is a terrific way to okay. kind of end our, our day. So. Jumping right into it, um, we do have a bunch of questions, and you guys feel free who you think is most appropriate. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Okay, here we go. Um, so one of the questions that came up, um, and, and everybody here, if you see a question, go ahead and like it, and it'll come to the top of our um, queue here, <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully we'll get to it. <laughs> so um, why don't um, medical providers, our physicians, um, healthcare providers warn us about environmental exposures? Um, what do you think? I, I think it's very frustrating um, for someone diagnosed with cancer, um, why that's never part of a standard care, standard care treatment plan. Um, would you like to? Yeah. So we. Um, so there's actually been some research on that. Um, uh, a lot of the time, um, people don't think about this, but doctors are quite insecure about um, looking like they don't have all the answers, um, and they they like to stick to their script. Um, what we've been trying to do at BCPP, and, and uh, actually people who are doing a really good job of this, are UCSF's pre-program, the program of reproductive productive health and the environment. Um, and what they've done, and we've worked with them on this, is to have a kind of a training course for doctors and, and nurses and other medical providers to say, okay, these are the environmental health issues you may not know about, uh, that people may be coming to ask you questions about, um, and uh, here are some of the answers, because they want the answers before they get asked the questions, and sometimes they don't have time to 
research all this stuff. Um, but yeah, um, it is an issue. Um, environmental health isn't really taught in medical school. It's a real issue. Um, the nurses do a lot better on this, actually, and um, it, it is taught. Uh, I'm sitting next to a nurse right here, and she will tell me this. Um, but yeah, um, it is an issue, and we, we've been uh, talking to a bunch of people. Um, I know ACOG, which is the um, obstetrics and gynecologists, um, have done a really good job of, um, you know, it, and if you've been pregnant, you get told a lot of this stuff, actually, from, from your gynecologist or, or obstetrician. Um, but um, getting that wider, especially to oncologists, I mean, they, they, I mean, I... Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I yeah. would add that it's political. <laughs> I, I would add the fact that there is resistance. Yeah. The American Nurses Association will adopt um, a support or a, a program. The American Medical Association doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I think that the trade associations, the medical associations, again, it's not taught and it's not implemented in a systematic review process that they would prefer to use. And, and there is resistance, but that's, that's our job. That's part of our job is to push on that, to ask the question when you go. Yeah. You ask and keep asking, and every time you go, ask a new question. Every time you go, bring a piece of literature. Every time you go, say, how come we don't know about this? I just learned this. Will you tell me about it? It's part of what moves the, uh, the ball forward. So it, it's political. OK, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about food. OK. <laughs> um, everybody's asking about microwaving. And mm -hmm. one of the biggest questions is those steam fresh bags of uh, veggies that are <laughs> yeah. much cheaper. Um, is it safe? Can people microwave bags in the microwave? I, things like that. I personally take them out of I those bags and put them in, in, uh, glass. in glass. Um, you can get these great um, glass dishes that have lids, so you can steam within them. Um, yeah, I take them out of the bags. I really do. And I didn't do that before I worked at the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. I've learned all this stuff in the last six years. And, and you don't have to do, so all those tips I gave you, you don't have to do that all at once. I mean, it's taken me six years to get to a stage now that I look in my medicine cabinet and I go, okay, I feel good about this. I, you know, and like when I finish something, I, I, you know, I can't afford to change all of my, my stuff at once, but whenever I need a new lotion, I, make, I look for the right one. And whenever I'm replacing a pan, I used to have nonstick pans. I, didn't, I can't afford to have a whole new set of pans. But you know you can take it one step at a time, and as I say, it's taken me six years. Um, but I think I've got there now, so it's great. I, I still haven't replaced my mattress. I'm going to say that I still have a, a mattress. I haven't. But when I do, I just it's going to not have flame retardants. In it. Good. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so we've had several questions, uh, you know, going into the expense, uh, and and maybe I think Sarah, for you, um, might be able to answer this. Um, so organic natural products tend to have a reputation for not working as well as their con conventional equivalents, and of course tend to be, or the perception is they tend to be more expensive. Yeah. Can you kind of? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is um, not just the perception. I do think that that is still true, and I think that um, that's where you know when we when we go to formulate our products, one of the biggest things that we're looking for is efficacy. Does it work? Um, you know, whether, again, I mentioned a surface cleaner. Does it actually get your counter clean? Um, when, when you come to, when it comes to makeup, there are so many, you know, natural brands out there, and we, we try not to use that word natural because um, it doesn't actually mean anything. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, there are so many out there, but maybe they don't stay on. Maybe that doesn't feel good on your skin. Um, and so we really try and, um, and formulate and reformulate and reformulate until we get it right. Um, but the ingredients that we're using, they are more expensive. And um, that's part of the nature of the world that we're in. It tends to be that the less safe ingredients are the cheaper ingredients. They've been around for a lot longer or they were developed precisely because they could be used at a lower cost. Um, and so I think one of the reasons that we're so big on advocacy and pushing for more transparency and better regulation of chemicals that are in the products that we're using is to help drive down the cost of some of those ingredients because the more that the big guys 
are adopting some of these same standards um, and having to disclose the ingredients that they're using and, and being held by their consumer base to a higher standard, um, the more that they can invest in the research and in the, you know, the, the supply chain that is going to, I think, hopefully drive down the price and really sort of democratize the use of some of these safer ingredients. Um, but yeah, no, we acknowledge. I mean, our price point is slightly higher than uh, so a traditional and brand. And another way to approach that is count how many products you're using every day in your home and how many things that you don't finish. Mm -hmm. Does anybody finish everything that they use before they buy something else? Think about the total dollars you spent in a category, whether it's personal care or cleaning or whatever, and spread that out over fewer, safer products. So there are people that have actually done their own personal math on that, where you can make some safer choices and stay within a total budget and drive the market, as Sarah's talking about, which will result in a lower price point. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of effort, but it's something that you can consider. And I would encourage you, if your favorite product is, I don't know, you know, I'm not going to, I won't say any product names, but let's just say it's a, a big multinational conglomerate that makes this product. I don't know, call them too and say, hey, <laughs> why are you still using this ingredient that is known to be a, a hormone-disrupting sure. chemical? We hear from consumers all the time and we love to engage with them. Try it with the big guys too. Right. And, um, and you know, we are pushing them in that direction. Um, organizations like BCPP and YSC and others are pushing them in that direction, but they need to hear from their consumers too. And right. actually a lot of like just sort of um, grassroots campaigns, uh, Women's Voices for the Earth does right. this so well. Mm -hmm. um, you can join these, these campaigns to, to tell companies, hey, stop using this ingredient. Right. And, uh, and I think that's another really effective way to make change. Um, another question is in regards to young adults and preteens starting to get into beauty products, makeup, things like that. Is there any advertising or programs to kind of teach them the importance of making wise decisions at an early age um, and spending a little bit more on some of these products instead of just, you know, going to what isn't necessarily as healthy for them? I'm not sure about advertising. There are some groups out there. There was a group, are they called Turning Green now? They used to be called Teens Turning Green. Yeah, Turning Green, um, that specifically looks at, um, at they, they start off with teenagers. They now do some college work as well, um, in, um, educating um, girls and boys on safe product choices. So there are advocacy groups out there that are specifically looking at that demographic. Um, yeah, Turning Green's the one that comes to mind. Anybody? Got any others? Okay. And they've got some great stuff that is aimed specifically at young people. Really young people. You're all young people. Mm -hmm. Tweens. I'm a young person. <laughs> a young person. <laughs> okay, great. So um, there's a lot lately, a new trend is essential oils, natural oils. So we've had a lot of interest, a lot of um, questions about um, some of the natural oils, lavender, tea tree, um, con uh, are they considered to be hormone disruptors? Maybe this is something somebody's read or heard. Um, should we con be concerned about that? And does um, BCPP have any information on that? Yeah, certainly, um, y yes, I, I am concerned a little bit about lavender. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I try and avoid lavender myself. I mean, so there are, I mean, so just because a product is natural and, and is, you know, present in the environment normally doesn't mean it's safe. Arsenic is totally natural. <laughs> Cyanide, it's, you know, I mean, you know, so, um, so yes, even natural, natural ingredients um, uh, that are not derived from petrochemicals uh, can have concerns, and so uh, we do have on our red list, we've got some of the uh, constituents of some of those essential oils that we recommend avoiding, um, and they're, yeah, so. That information would be on the website, I'm yeah. sure. Yes, so. it's on the website, yeah. And I would also say, because we do actually use some essential oils to create some of our scents, but what we're constantly doing too is working with fragrance houses that are willing to disclose those blends, right. yeah. um, and, and if it's something that we have deemed, and if it's on the red list, you know, it's, how do we move those fragrance houses to use different um, different blends so that we as a, as a formulator and as a manufacturer have opportunities and options to avoid some of those? And the other thing too is that, you know, just because it's an essential oil, it doesn't mean that it is not going to cause even just 
whether it's a, a hormone disruption is another matter, but even just some people have a, an allergic reaction. Yeah, right. So just because something is an, is an essential oil doesn't mean that you're not gonna react to it or that someone else might not react to it. Um, but that's why disclosure is mm -hmm. so important. Being able to know what is actually creating that scent, I think is, is something that is really uh, just critical for, for consumers. Time-wise, a couple more? Yeah, couple. Cool, okay. Okay, um, a couple of us are asking if we've already been diagnosed with cancer, if we're metastatic, is there still a benefit of trying to change what we're using, change what we're eating to maybe stop the progression or you know, just help us stay healthier? So as I said, um, we believe so. Um, there isn't that much research out there specifically on people with a diagnosis of breast cancer. Um, certainly, People with hormone positive breast cancers, you want to be avoiding um, some of the um, estrogenic uh, hormone disruptors out there. Um, so as I say, we, we are going to do more research on this, um, we're, we're hope that's going to be our major next project. But I, yeah, I think um, especially for people with hormone positive, um, the, the stuff Well, we're I think it goes to the core principle of, of precaution. Yeah. It goes to the idea that in the presence or some evidence of harm, you take a proactive approach to avoiding it. If we said that there was a 50-50 chance that your lunch was contaminated, would you eat it today, right? Or you wouldn't do it. You just wouldn't. You would take precaution. So with the evidence that these chemicals have an impact on developing fetus, early childhood, um, during pregnancy that contribute to early puberty, contribute to um, changes in the mammary gland, that should be enough for us to understand that they should be avoided at any case, and that anything that contributes to disrupting your body's system cannot be good as you're going through this progression, as you're concerned about your health and wellness going forward. So hold that principle as you think about your decisions and you think about your choices. And again, call for the kind of research. Yeah. Not enough research has, no. done, uh, has been done on this. And I think that one of the things that has actually prompted some more of this research, ironically, is um, that a whole bunch of Marines got breast cancer from working at Camp Lejeune with solvents, mm -hmm. men, a whole bunch of men. That has provoked a whole bunch of concern in the federal government to really talk about. I'm just saying. No, it's, um, I, you're but, absolutely but right. But we need to push for that. That's the kind of research that we need to do more of. Yeah. So and yes, I, think, I would say take it seriously. Keep it in your I'm going to live a healthier lifestyle bucket and do everything you can. And again, be an advocate. Right. Tell yeah. your story. If right. you're concerned about not knowing enough about what you should be doing as your you know as you are moving through your journey pick up the phone go go meet with your representative or his or her staff and make that personal connection that this is really important to you that that our government needs to investigate more what are some of these links between chemical exposure and causes of breast cancer and and other diseases and um, and, and encourage them to invest in that research right. um, we need, we need more research, and I, I can't emphasize highly enough how important it is that, that folks in Washington, in your local state legislatures, hear from you. Um, you can really make a, an impact that way. Very good. Uh, I think last question, because along those lines, there's been several questions about how each of us can personally advocate, and one of them really is in regards to a safer food supply. Oh. So can you talk a little bit about that, especially, I live in Ohio, <laughs> you know, we have a lot of agriculture, a lot of, yeah. a lot of fertilizer, a lot, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, it's so confusing. So mm -hmm. can you talk about, um, very quickly, <laughs> lower content of persistent organic pollutants, lower envi environmental impact of the food production, anything along those lines? How can someone advocate for a safer food I, supply? I would suggest following Pesticide Action Network, okay? That is a, that's a national group that really addresses this issue um, across states, across uh, in terms of the reduction of, of those chemicals in agriculture. You can probably Google in your own state, in your own community, what is being done. Uh, and then the other part of food is 
packaging. Mm -hmm. So the food packaging piece, we have a lot of mm -hmm. information on our site about that, about what is food in, whether it's in a can or other kind of packaging, how is it transported to you, what's the energy use in the transport. So I sit and I think, do I need to buy that thing that came 3,000 miles to me? Does it need to go through that energy suck to get to me, all the fossil fuels needed to transport it to me. So there's a lot of things that you can think about as you're, as you're choosing how you will eat and what you will eat. And then you'll go to a restaurant and you'll get canned food and there'll be nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so I'm yes, well thank you. And yeah. I know I see the okay. sign. We I did, go. one big question that came up, I did confirm that slides from the general sessions will be available on the YSC website. Uh, give us a couple days to get home, okay. get on it. Right. But they will be available, which, because I know there's, there were several questions about Great. the slides you guys Great. presented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.